The use of computer gaming in archaeology is one of the most exciting parts of this. Before, we were studying either on the basis of maps, you know, that top-down, that sort of god view of the world, um, which isn't real, that's not how people in the past looked at the world. Um, and people have recognised that, so then they, they visit sites themselves. Then that doesn't really work because you're looking at the modern landscape. And going beyond that is, is critical. This might look like an ordinary bit of field, but what we're finding under the ground beneath our feet are clues which are going to help us to understand the site over there, Stonehenge. Stonehenge doesn't just sit there in splendid isolation. If the tourist or visitor turned away from the stones themselves and actually looked at the low ridges and hills which surround it, they'd see a series of low mounds. And these are burial mounds. You cannot understand Stonehenge itself unless you understand the landscape around it. We're going to look between the monuments. We're going to map the things that people do not know and have not seen. We're using two main techniques to see beneath the soil here. Uh, the first one's magnetics, magnetometry, and the second one we're using ground penetrating radar, which gives us a three-dimensional picture. We've been using magnetometers and, and radar for some considerable time. The difference is we fit the, the sensors to quad bikes and simply drive across the landscape now, whereas in the past we used to actually have to lay out grids and carry the, the, the equipment manually back and forwards collecting data. Um, the other thing is global positioning systems. Every bit of data that comes in is immediately georeferenced. We know where it is and it fits together seamlessly. And we've never been able to do it quite like this before. We went to the area to survey it simply because it was flat and easy to survey and we wanted to test out the equipment. Um, we did this and almost immediately saw that there was a, there was a circular arrangement. It wasn't too obvious at that point in time. These are the results from the first magnetic survey of, of the mound just here. And what it shows is beneath that slight rise, there's a circle of these, these post holes or the, the, these large pits. They're about the right size and shape to once held very large timber posts. So if we'd been stood on this spot 4,000 years ago, maybe 4,500 years ago, what we'd have seen would have been a large timber circle just here overlooking Stonehenge. So when we collect all the data in the field, we start to understand some of these sites and, and what's actually below the ground. But it's when we get back to the lab that we can start to reconstruct those past landscapes and interpret them. Because there's been so much investment and development of, of computer games, it means there's a whole new way of engaging with the world. So what we're doing is we're taking the data we generate at Stonehenge and we're bringing it into the environments you can get into, into computer games. It allows you to start looking at how your interpretations work in reality. So you know, it's very easy to, to talk about how you think it might have looked, but then to actually see it, you start questioning yourself. It raises new questions and new ways of thinking about what you're doing. And I think that is really critical because it, it feeds back into the whole interpretation process. So it's both exciting and also enlightening, at least through the generation of new questions. Once you've created this, this game environment, it's great because you, you can actually access this in all sorts of different ways. So it, it'll be available over a mobile phone, potentially, as well as through something very sophisticated like we have here, which is um, a three-dimensional three screen. So you use glasses like these to actually see your environment in, in three dimensions. So you can start exploring the landscape and looking at the relationships between monuments. How does the architecture work? Why are certain choices, why, why do they build things in certain ways? Why do they build them where they were? We start addressing these sorts of questions. Even though the project's only been running a short time, we are adding significantly to our knowledge of Stonehenge and therefore our understanding. The presumption has been that Stonehenge stands there in splendid isolation and that perhaps the area between the burial monuments and Stonehenge itself was sacrosanct in some ways. So if there was another monument similar to Stonehenge operating within such a short distance of Stonehenge, then our interpretation must change one way or another.
Now, archaeologists will argue forever about what that means, but it is a fundamental shift. For more on new discoveries at Stonehenge, check out the March issue of Scientific American, available online and at newsstands February 22nd.